Hello and welcome to the print soft cover. We have with us uh, Professor Scott Stroud. He is an assistant professor at the University of uh, Texas. And uh, we will be talking about his latest book, The Evolution of Pragmatism in India. And uh, it's an intellectual biography of Baba Sahib Ambedkar. Now, uh, Professor, Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, if you could, you know, start by uh, telling what is Ambedkar's pragmatism all about? I mean, sure, he is, uh, it's influenced by John Dewey. Um, so can you tell us what it is about? Yes, uh, and Prashant, you you hone in right on the key term pragmatism, and you know the first question we should ask is what is pragmatism, and and then we could talk about how Embedkar is that or how it's useful to talk about him like that. But you know when I you know I am an American philosopher, I study people like John Dewey and William James, and you know they're part of a school of thought called pragmatism. You know and they don't all believe the same thing, but they all believed you know certain themes were important, things like democracy things like community, you know, and community mattered in democracy, community also mattered in scientific inquiry, you know, so th these thinkers were uh, writing a lot of their key works from, you know, 1900 to uh, 1950. And so, so uh, uh, you know, these, these thinkers we call pragmatists, they were focused on how to reconcile science and philosophy in an ever-changing world. And so when I, you know, heard about the Embedkar story, you know, where he was a student of John Dewey's, no one really went into detail how he was influenced or how he received or rejected or resisted the story of pragmatism that comes through this, this specific individual of John Dewey. You know, and so then I started to say, well, maybe I should be the one to tell that story. There are many stories people tell about Bimrao and Bedkar, uh, mm. but no one has told that story. And so, so when I talk about Embedkar as a pragmatist, I'm really pointing at this story that everyone knows is out there, but no one has given any details on which is his relationship in the classroom at Columbia University with John Dewey and his lifelong fascination with the books that he continued to buy authored by John Dewey and what this meant for Embedkar's creative thought. So what shape did he give uh, to his version of pragmatism? Uh, how did he separate it from John Dewey's pragmatism to uh, Indian pragmatism, which he used in uh, sort of reviving, not reviving, but uh, reformulating Buddhism. Yes, we, you know, if you know Embedkar, you typically know him as kind of a visionary Buddhist thinker, you know, revising what uh, we think of as the social potentials of Buddhism. And, you know, my book tries to make the argument uh, using archival sources that no one else has ever uncovered, that young Embedkar at Columbia University was committed to not replacing Buddhism with pragmatism, or replacing pragmatism with Buddhism, but combining the best parts of Dewey's pragmatism and democracy with the best parts that he saw in Buddhism. You know, when he was a young kid and got K. Kaluskar's book on the life of the Buddha, he's been fascinated by Buddhism. So, so this is, I think, the, the way to think about Embedkar in a new way, combining this kind of democratic theory from Dewey and this kind of Buddhism he had been always infatuated with as kind of a liberatory philosophy, a way to free himself and others from the strictures of caste. So one thing that obviously becomes evident there is that Embedkar put a lot more weight on religion and organized religion even than John Dewey. You know, John Dewey didn't see much hope in religion in his last, let's say, three or four decades of life. Uh, at one point, someone said, Dewey, why don't your kids go to Sunday school? And Dewey said, I, you know, referring to his religious upbringing, when I was a kid, I went to enough Sunday school for my whole family's future. So Dewey was skeptical of religion being an emancipatory, critical endeavor. And Bedkar saw just the opposite. Buddhism became a, a canvas for Baba Sahib to, to say, here's how to be rational, and here's how to create fraternity with your fellow humans in society. And so there's a lot more, there's many other themes that kind of differentiate these two. There's some things that Dewey didn't even like anymore in his thought from his early days, that Embedkar said, hey, that's useful, and Embedkar ran with it. So it's an incredibly complex story of extension and resistance. Yeah. Okay, since you mentioned uh, uh, religion's influence um, on Ambedkar, so how is it that in today's time, uh, when 
the Dalit community who have been uh, joining the Hinduism or Hindu uh, society. And uh, in the same way, the Hindu society is also co-opting them. So was there any scope during uh, Ambedkar's uh, time that he leave room for this negotiation with religion? Yeah, you know, the, the contemporary political aspects of the Dalit or the Bahujan movement are, are very complex. And mm. I'm by no means an expert on it. Um, but yet in Ambedkar's time, he sensed that, you know, one had to be flexible. You know, and so I think this is one thing that's fascinating about pragmatism in general and Ambedkar's form of pragmatism. It, it worries about being dogmatic, even in the answers it thinks are the best answers. So, so that kind of fallibilism, that openness to being, you know, corrected or realizing that you have something that's not totally optimized to the circumstances of a changing world. You know, that was there in Ambedkar. Uh, you know, clearly he pushed in the 50s for people, you know, his fellow Dalits to, you know, to, to reject, you know, a form of Hinduism that he thought was just inherently oppressive to them. So, so you know, the, the, we see his commitments, uh, but, you know, various speeches, he pushes that line in different ways. You know, so some of his speeches to upper caste reformers, you know, he gives different appeals than his speeches to his fellow Dalits, who some of them, many of them couldn't read, but they were interested in emancipation through conversion. So, so that kind of is an exciting but complex aspect of Ambedkar. Which uh, whom, of whom you say was a global philosopher. So yeah. were there uh, or are there uh, thinkers and philosophers who have been influenced by Ambedkar as Ambedkar perhaps was uh, influenced by Professor Dewey? I mean, we, you look at the news today in America and you see a lot of people like activists and legislators, policymakers are influenced to some extent by Ambedkar, or at least Ambedkar's in those debates about, let's say, caste discrimination. So, so I think we are watching his reputation and his influence unfold. I mean, one of the challenges, right, was Ambedkar's collected works weren't published till you know, around 1980. So it was tough to get at his thought. And even today, many people think of him as just a political figure just a figure in the history of the constitution of India and its drafting, just an activist. And so one of my missions as an academic in the West has been to say, hey, Ambedkar is a thinker, you know, that's just as you know insightful or as important as John Dewey or Jane Addams or William James or W.E.B. Du Bois. So why don't we include him in our classes? And more importantly, why don't we include him in our stories of these thinkers who engage democracy, let's say. So, so that's kind of one of my missions. Other people have different uses of Embedkar, of course, but I, I'm very interested in showing how he is a theorist of democracy and also an anti-caste thinker. These two things go together in his thought, but sometimes you can separate them if you want. Okay. So uh, what was it about Dewey's pragmatism that uh, pulled Ambedkar, uh, you know, towards it and he saw a link between his pragmatism and caste injustices in India. This is something I continue to just be fascinated by, right? The, yeah. the probabilities of Embedkar ending up in Columbia in Dewey's classes, they had to have been low in the day, right? Because every other educated or soon to be educated Indian were typically not, they weren't Dalits. Yeah. And they went to England or you know, Oxford or you know, yeah. London or Cambridge. So there's something special about the fact that the Gaikwad of Baroda he was so infatuated with the American education system, right? He sent his son to Harvard and the, the Gaikwad sent Embedkar to Columbia. And even more so than that odd turn of fate, you know, Embedkar signed the Huzur order where, from the Gaikwad that said, you're only to take classes in economics, right? That was gonna be his degree, economics and politics mm -hmm. and nothing else. So somehow Embedkar took three classes from John Dewey. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and, India would be a different country if it had a different constitution. It'd probably have a somewhat different constitution if Embedkar hadn't been in, at Columbia or in Dewey's classes. So, so this is, a, this is a, a turn of fate that is so fortuitous for India, I think. Uh, what did he hear in those classes? You know, in my book, I'm, I'm the first one to find the actual notes that Bimrao Embedkar and his classmates took in these classes. So I know it, with exact certainty what Dewey told his classes on all these days. And you know, so then I'm able to say, like you ask, mm -hmm. what attracted Embedkar to this thinker? 
Um, you know, uh, so this is this is an interesting question. I think what attracted Embedkar to Dewey, he probably signed up for his classes just because Dewey was yeah. famous, mm -hmm. right? So probably, you know, Dewey was kind of the number one philosopher of his day in the 1910s. But once he was in that class, Dewey was incredibly boring. All of the students yeah, recall that Dewey group. was not a captivating speaker. And yeah. Bedkar, of course, was. But young Embedkar surely saw Dewey up there fumbling through, sitting at his desk, giving his lectures, the greatest views in Western philosophy. And, he, and, and Dewey was doing it with a certain charity, you know, because one of Dewey's commitments was the problem with philosophy is not thinking like Hegel, but thinking like Hegel has it right for all time. So Dewey was against the quest for certainty or dogmatic non-corrective action, you know, a uh, theory. So, so against, you know, timeless answers. So when Bedkar saw in those classes, this great thinker who is full of original thoughts himself, respectfully go through each of these thinkers that, you know, most people would dismiss and try to give them their due, try to show how John Locke was a rational answer to some of the challenges of his time, even though Dewey didn't believe in, let's say, John Locke's individualism. So, so surely what attracted Embedkar to Dewey was this rejection of certainty, of timelessness, of theories that just are right and we have to live by them, like the caste hierarchy, Embedkar would say. Ooh, uh, and, and then he saw this kind of embrace of science, which gave you useful answers, but without the dogmatism. So I bet you that is what interested Embedkar. Another theme we could talk about more is uh, Dewey was a big proponent of democracy, not just being at the political level, but also as a way of life. And I think Embedkar loved that idea of social democracy. Yeah, as you uh, mentioned in your book, he says that he owes all his intellectual life to uh, Dewey. And uh, so, which makes us think, why uh, or did Ambedkar, uh, you know, ever communicate with Dewey? And, and was there any correspondence between, between them, or at least from Ambedkar to Dewey? No, you know, none that I found. So Embedkar left Columbia in the, you know, like June of 1916. Mm -hmm. He returned back to Columbia and stayed there for a couple of weeks in like uh, 1931 with one of the roundtable conferences. He made mm -hmm. a side trip. And then he came back, of course, in 1952, just days after Dewey died for that honorary doctorate where he wrote that letter to Savita Embedkar mm -hmm. lamenting Dewey's passing. And so, so in all my research, in all my archival digging in India or the US, I've never found any hints or letters that Embedkar tried to write Dewey or Dewey tried to write him. So it's a fascinating relationship, right? It's very yeah. distanced and respectful. The yeah. student didn't feel like he had to tell the teacher his innovations or what caste oppression was about, for instance. So, so this is a, you know, it's a very distance, but the way Embedkar kept up with Dewey is fascinating. I've uh, tried to find every catch of books that, uh, you know, that are, that survive from Embedkar's huge public library, or his personal library. And, you know, I've, I found no other thinker that's as well represented as Dewey. There's some 22 books by Dewey or about Dewey in the surviving collections at about five locations of Embedkar's books. And so, and these date up to the 1950s. So it shows you that Embedkar was keeping up on what Dewey was doing, even though Dewey, I think, uh, you know, bat, you know, stupidly didn't keep up on what Embedkar was doing, yeah. and they didn't talk. So it was an interesting relationship. Yeah. So was he aware of Ambedkar's uh, reputation or his work? Uh, I have not found any evidence. Uh, you know, Dewey, Dewey's works, like Embedkar's, are online, so you can search them. And, you know, I found no mentions of Embedkar, no citations of Embedkar, no quotations. Uh, I've, I've tried to find, you know, th there's records of what Dewey's personal library, the books he had when he died, uh, mm -hmm. what were listed in those. So he owned no books by Embedkar. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I don't think he knew much of him. And if you look at Dewey's life, right, he starts in the 1890s. He mentions caste. He, he knew kind of what caste was about. He knew a little bit about Indian thought, mm -hmm. but he didn't really think there was much to get from Indian thought. By the 1930s, he's writing prefaces for books on Vedanta, eh, saying this is important stuff, but I I'm not an expert on it. Mm -hmm. And then by 1950, at the end of Dewey's life, he uh, is one of the first articles, maybe even the first article in the very important comparative philosophy journal, Philosophy East and West. 
published by University of Hawaii, which was an incredibly important school in getting Eastern and Western thought together in philosophy. So, so in, if you look at Dewey's narrative arc, he, become, he comes to comparative thought, global thought, very late. So this is his problem. He should have visited India in 1919 when he was going to China. He almost did. And I think his thought would have been radically different if he would have kept up on Ambedkar and Indian happenings. And perhaps they would have met. Yeah. Uh, and you know, this is a question. This is one thing I'm, that excites me about the Ambedkar project. So many people you know, tell a version of the Embedcar story that's, you know, you've heard, it's similar. It's annihilations of, of caste, et cetera. So I try to pause and, and, and ask questions at moments that have a little bit of a disjoint. So one of those moments was that kind of perplexed me was, you know, why didn't Dewey go to India in 1919, 1920? He goes to Japan, then his students, who sure who was a classmate of Embedkar in 1915-1916 in Dewey's class, uh, who sure invites Dewey over to China, mm -hmm. and he gives 200 lectures in China for about two years. And so one of my questions was, why didn't Dewey continue on to India? And so I look into the letters, and this is not in the book, this, is, this couldn't make the book, but you see in the correspondence of Dewey, Dewey talking to one of his friends back home who says, there's more good art in India in the temples than all of China and the U.S. combined. You know, and so Dewey was writes back, I'm going to go to India after China. And then eventually the China trip gets extended, expanded up to two years. It wasn't supposed to be that long. And Dewey writes back to his friend back home. This is Albert Barnes. He says, you know, Albert, uh, I don't want to lose track of my country. I'm getting homesick. Maybe I'll come back to India on a future trip. Maybe I'll go to Russia and then come down to India. And Dewey never did. Dewey never made it to India. And this is one of his biggest mistakes, I think, because his view on religion would have been fundamentally different if he would have saw a caste and how it structured life on the streets of, let's say, Bombay in 1921. He talks about force, uh, you know, uh, Professor Dewey, and uh, you also mentioned uh, how, uh, you know, the reconstructing society requires force. But what kind of force Dewey doesn't mention, doesn't say. Now, is Ambedkar's agitate educate, organize. Is that uh, a, a culmination or, or, the, uh, or the answer to Dewey's uh, uh, a force that he didn't specify or clarify what, it, what, what form it should take? Yeah, you know, it's very much related. And, uh, you know, one thing that I, I, I love to emphasize, Dewey and Embedkar were incredibly complex thinkers and they evolved over time. You know, so for instance, Dewey's collected works behind me, Right up here in the colorful volumes are uh, 8 million words, and in Bedkar's English works are something like 5 million words. And so, so Dewey changed over time. And when Embedkar sat in his class and he heard Dewey talk about force, Dewey was very much uh, a proponent of U.S. participation in World War I. It hadn't happened in 1915-16, but people like Dewey were saying, you know, Woodrow Wilson should engage the Germans and make the world safe for democracy. So, so in that context, young Embedkar hears Dewey talk about force, and Dewey wants to say there's there's a certain kind of force that's called force as violence, which mm. tends to try to quickly get ends, but it it sacrifices a lot of other ends, usually the ends of other people, yeah. like your enemies. And then there's force as energy, which gets things done, you know, in a constructive way, a sustainable way. You know, and so Dewey in 1915, 1916 was trying to make the, the argument that you know, sometimes war is the way to get things done, but you gotta be careful because in general violence destroys a lot. So Dewey was hesitant to always say violence is the answer, but he thought in the case of the great war, you know, democracy demanded it be defended. Uh, so, so Dewey, you know, of course Dewey was burned by World War I. You know, afterwards, uh, you know, he saw that it wasn't to make the world safe for democracy. It was just for empires to beat other empires. And so in World War II, in some ways, a more noble fight. Dewey was slower to advocate the use of arms against Nazi Germany than he might, you know, should have been. So, so in Bedkar, right? In Bedkar, he was in Dewey's class at a certain time, not when Dewey was a pacifist towards mm -hmm. World War II, but when he was saying you have to be intelligent about the use of force, you know. And so, so Dewey, in some ways, as you kind of intimate, set up a problematic, you know, yeah. how to use force without becoming. A, a you know a source of problems or oppression in your own way, 
And so through his whole life, you see him trying to educate, agitate, organize in a variety of ways, social yeah. movements, legislation, burning the man of Smirti, for instance. You know, he, he tries to do some things that are more in your face and some things that aren't. And, uh, you know, some of those paths he continues down. Some of them he doesn't, you know, keep going down. And so this is what is part of his pragmatist spirit, I think. Experiment with all these means and try not to use force that cuts too many corners. I mean, what does he say at the end of his life when he has that unpublished essay on Buddha or Karl Marx? He refers once again to Dewey on forces energy, forces violence, and Ambedkar castigates the communists of his day for relying too much on violence and sacrificing too many other people and too many other goals of other people for their own goals. You know, so Ambedkar is pretty set at the beginning of his life and at the end of his life. The path he's on is the democratic path and it requires democratic means, even if those are tough, even if those don't always seem to work. You know, that's the kind of faith he and Dewey had. Democratic ends require democratic means. So which uh, means uh, reconstructing institutions as well, because uh, reform, you know, comes through a form is, as Ambedkar says, is a form of education. Uh, but it's an uh, outside of the institutions. Now, does reconstructing institutions as uh, one of the uh, reviewers of the book written by Bertrand Russell, uh, Ambedkar talks about uh, reconstru reconstructing institutions. What does, uh, what could that entail in today's time? Yeah, you know, in those lectures heard from Dewey in 1915, 1916, uh, you know, and Bedkar hears Dewey talk about how we have habits as individuals, mm -hmm. and then as a group, we tend to have similar habits that we can call customs, you mm -hmm. know, and, and groups kind of enforce those customs, create those customs, you know, so you, you know, you being in India, you have certain ways of engaging the world that are different from my ways in America because of the groups and the institutions around us, formal or informal institutions. And so, so this is kind of part of the psychology and kind of sociology that he inherits from Dewey. The challenge is, right, is how do we reshape those things? Sometimes you can change the formal structure of an institution and slowly change the habits of the people involved in that. Sometimes, however, you can try to change the formal matters and then the habits will resist that. So for instance, you know, Indian driving is a lot different from American driving. You can pass laws, people stay in lanes, but it doesn't mean people's driving habits will necessarily track that new law. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. Uh, it's a matter to see how it flows out. But but this is kind of the challenge that Embedkar is working with and why he, as you say, he tries to agitate for some you know, political changes because you know, in some cases, those institutions will ripple down to the level of custom and habits, but he can't stop there. So this is why I find it fascinating. And Bedkar was a great speaker. He consistently put himself in front of audiences and made compelling, passionate arguments, trying to get people to change and people to change their world. So, so you know, if we look at him just as a political thinker, we get so fixated on laws that he tried to pass. But, you know, there's this other aspect to him where he was directly trying to reform people and institutions through his rhetoric, his persuasive speech. Has it been successful? I mean, uh, in looking at modern day India, I mean, the institutions, the, uh, the psychology of uh, humans to inform themselves, educate themselves. How successful do you, would you say it has been? His mission to... Uh, yeah. You know, it's obviously still an ongoing process, and this is one thing that's a challenge for reformers like Embedkar, and you, you know he felt this, right? His first, well, his second article he wrote was that review of Bertrand Russell that you mentioned, and I think why he reviewed that, and I make this argument in the book, is that, you know, he wanted to change the world and make it better, and Russell's book, the big theme was that people that are trying to reform the world or fight evil in the form of Germans or British or whatever, the, the other side thinks the same thing, you know, and so there was a cynicism in Russell that Embedkar had to come to terms with the idea that if I make the world in my image, using whatever power I might have or summon, will I become just as oppressive as the people I complained and fought against, you know, so Embedkar was enough of a pragmatist in terms of humility and humbleness to realize he has to at least think that thought a little bit uh, and watch out for becoming as oppressive as the people he wants to resist. And so, so this is a, 
you know, that humility is, you can't always have that as a reformer because then you won't have the drive to do stuff. So, so oftentimes reformers feel bad. They haven't solved a problem in five years, 10 years, 20 years. Uh, so things like racism in the U.S., things like casteism in India, things like sexism around the globe, these are obviously still problems. We've come a long way, I believe, in terms of institutions, in terms of habits, but we're by no means in the promised land. So, so I think this is what Embedkar meant when he said, you know, you don't have to push the caravan to its conclusion, but just push it forward. Don't let it go backwards it. after Embedkar's death. And so that I like that. That's a very pragmatist view. Dewey didn't solve forever many problems like people might think Plato had solved problems or some religious leader had solved problems. So, so I think Embedkar had that same mindset, the idea that, look, here's his best way of trying to engage these things. You all need to be creative and engage the similar things, but you know we all just need to push the problem, uh, you know, push the solution a little bit more forward. Don't feel confident you've done it and the job is done. So perhaps that's what separates uh, Dewey uh, and Ambedkar uh, in a sense that Ambedkar was uh, trying to, uh, you know, he was on a mission against something. Uh, uh, was there was there something pushing Dewey as well? Uh, during his time? Yeah, I mean, do, one of the problematics Dewey was fighting with was that he was an academic philosopher. You know, he made his money by being in philosophy departments. And so a lot of his battles, a lot of his books were aimed at other philosophers, you know, and how they extended a tradition that pursued what Dewey called the quest for certainty. You know, the idea that truth is timeless and Plato gets to it or Kant gets to it or science gets to it. So so Dewey in many ways was fighting an academic battle that Embedkar wasn't primarily concerned with. Mm -hmm. Dewey was also, though, very engaged in practical matters like education. You know, I think what one of the problems Dewey thought was that quest for certainty had implications for how we educate kids. We just tell them facts. You know, here's what you remember as truths. And you know, Dewey is, uh, was a big proponent of skill-based or experience-based education. So you learn something like biology and math by building a, a building in your school or having a school garden. You know, these kind of applied integrative type experiences. You definitely don't learn it best by just hearing me run through a proof on the board or tell you facts about Krebs cycle. So, so Dewey was you know, an activist in some ways, um, he was one of the initial signatories of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored Persons, uh, you know, the first kind of civil rights organization of a national stature. But but it, it was that wasn't his main problematic, you see. So so in Bedkar, uh, you know, was focused like a laser beam on caste, you know, and then you digress into academic debates about religion, let's say, because of the implications on caste. And so so there are good things and bad things to that. One of the good things is Embedkar's philosophy has a kind of unity to it that Dewey's doesn't. The bad thing is many of my Western academics have pigeonholed Embedkar, if they even know him at all, as just a political leader or just an activist. So, so I, you know, I try to resist that uh, you know, pigeonholing. He also was writing philosophical treaties. So yeah. I think there's a idea that philosophers, theorists are people who write books for other people who write books. You know, none of those people do anything. And Bedkar clearly wrote books, but he clearly did things. So he's a challenging figure to place. So is his Annihilation of Caste, is that a political book? Is that uh, because it can very well be the, um, uh, you know, like Marx's Communist Manifesto or other such great works? So what is it, uh, Annihilation of Caste? You know, for you know, those I, I, who haven't read it, I mean. Yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah. It, you know, it's it's where I started when I, you know, I, I've been studying Dewey a lot longer than I've been studying Embedkar. And so when I heard about Embedkar about 10 years ago, uh, or when I started looking into him about 10 years ago, I heard about him much earlier, yeah. but I ignored him, like many people do. I want to study the teacher, not the student. But when I started 10 years ago looking into the story of the student of John Dewey Embedkar, I said, wait, this guy is doing such great things in Annihilation of Caste, such creative things. Someone has to tell that story. And in many ways, the version of pragmatism I tried to squeeze out of Dewey in my early books on John Dewey and his aesthetic theory is yeah. the kind of view of uh, social and political philosophy that Embedkar gives in places like Annihilation. So Annihilation of Caste is a wonderful place to start. 
Uh, you don't want to end there, though. And Bedkar wrote so many other things. So I think he would even say, don't end with Annihilation of Caste. But what kind of book is it or text? I think it's it's you know many types. It's a it's a work of democratic theory, you know, because in it he talks about what it takes for a society to be democratic. You can have all the constitutions and voting protections you want, but if people don't have the habits of seeing each other with respect and trying to engage each other and share interests, even if they disagree, they're still community members of the same community. If they don't have those kind of habits, it's not a democracy. In it, you also see a very stringent critique of the caste system, you know, yeah. so, so it's, this is why activists to this day still refer to it as such a fundamental text, because it's incredibly focused on practical matters and critique. So, so it's a wonderful text. And, you know, another aspect I deal with in my book is, uh, think about it, he was going to give that to the Jatpat Todak Mandal, a group of, you know, 20 or 30 higher caste reformers. So it's a speech. It was meant to be a speech. And what's fascinating is he was going to give it to a friendly audience, right? Yeah. People that were convinced that caste was bad and needed to be reformed. And it was so in their face. You know, so it's an interesting, what I call rhetorical artifact, a message designed for this audience and to achieve certain goals with that audience. So that's one another spot I try to pause and be perplexed for a moment. Why would he be so... Uh, aggressive, talking about dynamiting the Shastras to people that were kind of on his side. You know, this is an interesting conundrum. He was a great speaker, so he surely knew he was going to be shocking to these people. Yeah. I think, and I talk about this in my book, I think the, the question comes back to, uh, you know, he wanted some people to wake up. You know, and these people had small changes for caste, but he really wanted to shock them. So in some cases, shocking messages are useful messages. In other cases, comforting messages might be the best way to go about preaching his dhamma, let's say. So, so it's a fascinating text. That's one way of using force, or is that yeah. one example of force? Yeah, you know, and that's, that's a theme that I try to emphasize in my book. I'm in a department of communication studies, even though my, my PhD is in philosophy. And so I'm very attuned to rhetoric or the art of persuasion, which, you know, put in a simple definition, you can say it's the art of adjusting ideas to people, your audience of the time, and it's an attempt to adjust those people to your ideas, you know, to change them. So, so rhetoric is not lying. Rhetoric is not flattery. Rhetoric is trying to be smart about how you package your argument or what you emphasize in your argument for this audience versus another. So, so Embedkar was a master of using rhetorical force. You know, rhetorical force is not violence, uh, right. but it's not just pacifism or waiting around for the world to change. So that's why I think Embedkar put so much of his life into the 500 or 800 or however many speeches he gave over all those years, standing in front of crowds of 30,000 or half a million. You know, he, he believed that he could change them and change the world if he said the right words. You know, and I, I think that's a beautiful belief in the power of language. So uh, with, uh, with the annihilation of caste, it is often uh, seen as a critique of uh, the religion in itself rather than just the caste. But uh, Ambedkar presents it, uh, like you said, uh, you know, his pragmatist views are visible even in that book. Uh, where he talks about the difference between law and uh, religion and rule and principle. So do you think, I mean, a better critique or a modern, uh, you know, like a rightful critique of annihilation of caste is still due? Yeah, I mean, we need to just keep thinking through the, the text, but yeah, you, you get at the important part. And I think Embedkar knew this was going to get him in trouble, right? Because mm -hmm. You know, the, the letters he publishes as a preface, they're worried about him putting dynamite to the Shastras and, you, you know, to saying things like get rid of the Vedas, etc. So, so Embedkar in that text, and I believe he intended to say this, it's in the first edition, he says, I don't mean to destroy religion in general. I mean mm. to destroy religion of rules, mm. not religion of principles. So he made a fine distinction, yeah. but just like Dewey, sometimes fine philosophical distinctions don't always make their mark on an audience that just you know runs with their first impression. So, so I think what people were hearing was Embedkar wanted to destroy all of religion. Yeah. What Embedkar meant was you need to reform Hinduism or whatever religion you're part of and make sure it's based upon these things called principles. 
Now, in that annihilation of caste, Embedkar echoes, without talking about Dewey's name, but he echoes a paragraph from Dewey and Tufts' 1908 book called Ethics. Mm -hmm. Now, at Siddharth College, Embedkar owns two copies of this 1908 book. You know, it's interesting to me that some books he owned multiple copies of. Dewey's Democracy and Education, I found that Embedkar owns four copies of it and multiple colored pencils, so many read it different mm -hmm. times. So some of these texts, like us, he owns and he never reads. Some books he owned and he read constantly and marked them and came back to them. And some texts ended up in his writing. So in that ethics book, Dewey and Tufts make the distinction between principles, something like the golden rule, which is flexible and allows you to engage an ever-changing world, and rules, which Dewey's example would be the Ten Commandments. Thou mm -hmm. shall not kill is fine, but it doesn't tell us how to deal with uh, hateful speech on Twitter, let's say. So, so as the world changes, rules can't keep up with it. So that's in the background behind annihilation. And Bedkar doesn't want you know, a system of religion that just has a bunch of rules that you have to follow. Don't touch these people. Always do this. Because it's not going to keep up with the world. And it's not going to be able to fix oppression or problems when you sense these problems in that religious system. So in that text, right, he doesn't explicitly propose Buddhism as the answer. You know, the two that he suggests in there were Sikhism. You know, he says maybe Guru Nanak has, you know, a, this, the resources to construct a religion of principle. And he says maybe the Upanishads, I think yeah. Tatwama Si, uh, maybe the Upanishads have the, uh, the, the potential for a principle of religion. Now, of course, by the 1950s, his story focuses in on Buddhism as the key way to make a religion a principle. But I think the same, the same thing is there. You know, he's not against religion in general. He's not against Hinduism in general. He's against certain kinds of religious views that are sedimented into rules. So uh, what are the, uh, like Dewey's pragmatism, what would you say, uh, what philosophy would best describe uh, Ambed Baba Sahib's work? I, you know, I, 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 you know, I'm a partisan of saying Ambedkar is a pragmatist, but when I say that, I don't mean to exclude his Buddhism. It's actually part of that story. And, you know, someone else could talk about him just as a politician, let's say. And, you know, that's fine. That's not excluded. So so I, I really think that we gain something if we add to all these ways of talking about him, if we talk about him as a pragmatist. And, you know, think about what he's doing with Buddhism. In 1950, he says, the Buddha gave his followers license to chip and chop at his religion, get rid of the deadwood, reconstruct it, as Dewey would say. In Annihilation of Caste, he talks about Dewey saying society doesn't have to transmit its tradition all at once. Society can, you know, cut off the deadwood. If you look closely at that explicit quotation from Dewey in Annihilation, there's in the middle of it dot, dot, dot. You know, and this always interested me. So I looked up the exact spot in Dewey's Democracy and Education where Embedkar got that line. And what does he leave out? Well, Dewey has one sentence in there, or two sentences in the middle, talking about formal education, schools. So what's fascinating to me is that, you know, Embedkar reads his teacher talking about how you need to reconstruct society, use what's useful in the past, but don't be afraid to abandon dead wood or things that aren't useful going forward. Uh, and Dewey's talking about the schools as the way to do that kind of reconstruction. So what do you see Embedkar do? He reconstructs Dewey on reconstruction. He mm -hmm. makes Dewey speak to general issues of society and caste and not just schools. Because as we know about Embedkar's activism, education was part of it, but it wasn't the main or only way to attack caste oppression. You know, so, so this is fascinating. He sees a theme in Dewey of reconstruction, but he reconstructs Dewey as one of those past resources to make a better future argument. So again, if the question is not, does Embedkar mimic or echo or directly duplicate Dewey's philosophy? The question for me is always, What's he doing when he looks back at Dewey? What's he doing with Dewey? What's he resisting? What's he rejecting? What's he extending? So it seems like, you know, uh, his uh, uh, time at Columbia and afterwards was laborious. I mean, he was, it, it, uh, he was, it, it was an exhaustive uh, time that he was spending there with his thought, with, his, with the ideas that Dewey was teaching in his classes. And, you know, some would say, you know, any thinker or person would be a product of their times, but 
Ambedkar wasn't uh, limited by that uh, idea. He he challenged himself and he went ahead and reworked some of uh, Dewey's thoughts and ideas. I mean, uh, how critical is that for uh, people or scholars or thinkers and even human beings today in general to kind of follow that path? Yeah, I mean, if there's one common theme to all the pragmatists like Jane Addams, John Dewey, W.E.B. Du Bois, it's that society or the world is not set. You know, whether it's what we consider true is not just out there waiting to be discovered or the ideal social arrangement is not what we've inherited from our you know, fathers and mothers. So the world is not set and we have a part to play in reconstructing it. And so you, you could think of Embedkar as a student. Well, that's what he's doing, right? He is taking parts of Seligman his advisor, you know, when it comes to tax policy or the Central Bank of India, and he's using what he learned there. So, I mean, in many ways, Embedkar is being a, a very pragmatist thinker in how he picks and chooses and innovates on what he learned in his education. You know, a less important version of Embedkar would have been the young Embedkar who just heard teachers and then just constantly quoted them and referred to them and did the exact same thing. So, so this is why I'm always surprised when people say, oh, you know, most of my critics haven't read my book, but they'll typically say, I haven't read it yet, but he, I know Embedkar's not a pragmatist because he's different from Dewey. Of course he's different from Dewey. Dewey was different from young Dewey and old Dewey. So so this kind of, you know, the nuance and what we mean by pragmatism, I think is incredibly important. And I think what it does is it opens up new ways to see the familiar details of Embedkar. You know, so that what we're focusing on here is this reconstructive urge this, this urge that's with him from 1918 all the way to the Buddha and his Dhamma that, you know, I don't have to just reproduce Buddhism. I can emphasize certain things, de-emphasize other things that are not as useful for my struggle for social justice. So, so when we talk about Embedkar's pragmatism, we're really talking about him as this creative agent in his speech, in his writing, in his advocacy. And it's, it's a fascinating journey if you you know, and I try to tell my Western academics, pay attention to the journey that Embedkar has been on because it's it's fascinating. There's nothing else like it in philosophy. So is his pragmatism, uh, uh, is it atheism, radicalism? What is it? How? Well, you know, I, yeah, his pragmatism is, you know, a view that theory needs to be practical. So when we talk about religion, is our views of a theistic system or whatever, is this practical, you know? So, so like, for instance, William James, who, and Bedkar had some of William James's books in his surviving library, but he didn't make much of James's thought. William James, you know, had a space for God in his philosophy. Now, and Bedkar, I don't think, found a theistic approach to religion that useful. You know, I think he was like Dewey in some ways, talking about God as a special being with access, maybe even creative power over the metaphysical truths of the world would tend to harden and set all your, your social rules, your mores, your beliefs, you know, and it'd lead you into things that Embedkar felt a pinch of, like caste oppression, like he belonged in this birth because of some law of karma. So, so Embedkar, I think, was skeptical of theism, so I wouldn't call him a theist. Uh, you know, his Buddhism, he explicitly, he calls it a religion. You know, he doesn't talk about it as a philosophy, but he calls it a religion, yeah. but he continually refers to it as a rational system of thought and as self-critical. You know, you can criticize the Buddha if you want and examine his, you know, statements based upon your experience. And so, so yeah, you know, in many ways, Embedkar flummoxes our distinctions between science over here and religion over here. He talks about Buddha, Buddhism as a religion that's very scientific. So what form of Ambedkar's pragmatism uh, is going to take, uh, you know, in today's time with thinkers advancing on it, or let's say, I mean, you were the first scholar to dig so much deep into it, his relation with Dewey's uh, pragmatism. Uh, what has uh, Ambedkar's pragmatism left the upcoming scholars and researchers with? I mean, well, you know, there's so many stories you can dive into in Embedkar, and I think there's a lot more now after my book, at least, that, uh, you know, we could start to look into and talk more about when it comes to his interaction with Dewey. I think, you know, and I, and you, you were right. I mean, I'm one of the first to dive into real detail in it, but I'm not the first to notice the Dewey and Bedkar story. And so I've, I've been very fortunate that there have been people like Eleanor Zelliot, Gail Omvet, uh, uh, you know, other scholars that have 
said a little bit about this uh, this relationship, but you know, I think gone are the days where we just simply hold up Dewey and say he's one thing, and then here's Embedcar, and Embedcar's beyond that, or Embedcar's the same as that. You know, I think if if one theme comes across in my book is that Embedcar didn't read all of Dewey, it mm -hmm. didn't know about everything Dewey wrote, and Dewey, you know, was an evolving thinker. Things that he believed and wrote in his early years. He didn't, you know, talk that way. He didn't believe those things. He didn't argue those things in his later years. So I think gone, hopefully, you know, are the simplistic approaches that, oh, Dewey was this, and Embedkar clearly went beyond that. Uh, I think we need to dive into details um, and look more at these two thinkers and what what part of Dewey do we want to talk about in relation to Embedkar? So, so there's so many more things. And my next projects are going to be on the evolution of Embedkar's Buddhism in the 1950s, because I talk about his Buddhism at the end of my book, but I by no means get to exhaust it. But in many ways, you know, if the archival stuff I unearthed in my book is accurate, uh, Embedkar's Buddhism is his pragmatism. He wanted to combine these two. So there's so much more to tell about how his thought evolves from the Buddha and his gospel in 1951, the first draft, to the, la the final draft, the Buddha and his Dhamma, which comes out right after he dies. So, you know, he's constantly changing and revising his approach to Buddhism. And, and so there's stories to be told there, and there's stories that very much implicate this kind of idea of pragmatism. So, again, I'm always surprised when people think that calling him a pragmatist shuts down debate. In, in my case, I think it just opens up new ways to ask questions. We will look forward to your next project, and uh, hopefully we will get to talk to you uh, uh, about that as well. Uh, thank you so much for well, joining us. Uh, well, thank you, Prashant, and yeah. uh, the, the folks yeah. at the print. And I, I'm, I'm excited for people to read this book and agree yeah. or disagree with it, but at least see that there's more to be said. Yeah. Thank All you. Right. Thank you, Professor. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.